Hey, this is Stephen St. John, and I want you to listen to my new podcast, Hot Mike with SSJ. You can watch Hot Mike with SSJ on YouTube or download the podcast wherever you download your favorite podcasts. You are listening to Gangland Wire, hosted by former Kansas City Police Intelligence Unit Detective Gary Jenkins. Welcome, welcome all you wiretappers out there back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. We have a really interesting and, and kind of different show today. You know, we, we always talk about these mob bosses and these hitmen and things like that. Well, we're going to get around to some of these mob bosses, but we're going to go via a uh, what we would call a high class prostitute of the uh, early uh, 1900s, 1920, 1930s the jazz age and, and when actually they looked at prostitution a little different society did back then. Uh, we have Debbie Applegate who wrote a book, Madam, the biography of Polly Adler, uh, icon of the jazz age. There you go, folks. So, uh, and I'll have a link to that on the uh, show notes, guys. So if you want to take a look at that book or, or buy it, get a Kindle version, why the link to the Amazon will be on in my show notes. Welcome, Debbie Applegate. Yeah, oh, I could not feel more welcome. Thank you for bringing me on. Well, you may not know this, Debbie, but the Mafia is primarily a male-dominated organization, and the people who are interested in the Mafia are primarily males. I, I look at my oh, analytics. I have noticed. I have <laughs> noticed indeed. I look at my analytics. It's like, oh, my God. So when I saw this and I thought, here's a chance to maybe open up my audience just a little bit and, right. and, and expose these guys to a little different view of, of the mob and, and the, the mob through a woman's eyes. I, I have had I did have a uh, mob wife on at one time, uh, I don't know, huh. a couple of years ago. Uh, but but you're the first one since then. It's been, I think, three, maybe four years since I've had that. But uh, I really am happy to have you. I, I was so glad that you uh, agreed to come on the show. And I was going through your book, and there's a lot of interesting things in there and, and a lot of interesting people that we talk about a lot. You know, Frank Costello, uh, Luke, Lucky Luciano. But I, I guess, first of all, tell, tell me a little bit about yourself, your history and your writing career and, and how you got interested in this particular subject? Well, I'm one of those people who always thought uh, writers were magic. I thought, I don't know how they do it. I loved reading and I figured one thing I would never be able to do was be a writer because they obviously were magicians and I was not magic. Uh, so I'm a little surprised myself to find that this is what I'm doing for a career. In fact, I've been doing this so long that I may have unfit myself for any other real <laughs> honest work. Uh, I, so because I like to read, I was reasonably good in school and I kind of stayed in school and just stayed in school and especially liked old stuff. That's it. I like to read and I liked old stuff. And uh, you, you got that you got that combination hung around your neck. Chances are pretty good you're going to become a historian. Uh, so I sort of drifted my way into becoming a historian. I got a Ph.D. in American studies, which kind of leaves everything open. I can do anything as long as it's American. I can I can do anything. There you go. And in fact, as I like to tell my husband, I have a doctorate. Uh, so I, he can call me doctor and I'll give him advice. And he says, but that's only if it's folk medicine. <laughs> uh, but uh, and my first book was very different. Uh, it was a biography of a minister, once extremely famous minister, a guy named Henry Ward Beecher, uh, who is now probably remembered uh, best as the little brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote the massive mega bestseller, super influential novel, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, and they were very critical in the Civil War effort and the abolitionist effort. Uh, but then uh, my subject, uh, Henry Ward Beecher, uh, he got himself involved in a clerical sex scandal that was uh, of tremendous proportions, uh, consumed the country for well over two years. Uh, it was a great topic. It was, he's a great character. He's, uh, for all his flaws, I really loved working on him. Uh, but then when I finished, I thought, well, I thought I'll never write another book again because this is ridiculous. This is hard work and I don't know who reads books. Uh, but then I'm a sucker. 
And, uh, and I always loved the 1920s. That was always something I had enjoyed. And I was going through the stacks in the Yale University Library and in the section devoted to the 20s. And I ran across this book, Little Red Bound Volume, uh, called A House is Not a Home. And I didn't know what it was. Uh, I'd never heard of the author, who was Polly Adler. And uh, I picked it up, took it home, it was a fabulous read. It was her memoir, Polly Adler's memoir of being um, a young immigrant who came over from Russia uh, around uh, 1913. Uh, and then she came without her parents. And then World War I happens. Her parents are stranded in Russia. She's here in the United States by herself. And as many of your listeners know, that's, that's kind of a, that's a recipe for drifting into crime. Uh, having to support yourself from a young age without any help or supervision. And uh, as much for young women as it was for young men. Uh, she shares a background, actually, with a lot of the people you know about, uh, Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky. She's from the same uh, area, actually, as Meyer Lansky. And she's about the same age as all of those gangsters, born around, born, well, she's not quite sure, but more or less 1900. Uh, and like a lot of those early gangsters, she arrives here at a time where she's kind of half in between cultures. She's, she's plenty an Im very much an immigrant for, with a, a childhood somewhere else, but very much an American very quickly. Uh, and sometimes that, that was the generation that ends up uh, caught between uh, and ends up more likely being in crime. So once I read this, I'm already getting off on a tangent because I, I'd rather talk about Polly than myself. But I'll say this, that once, uh, once I fell in love with that book, then I really, I was going down the primrose path myself. And uh, so I started on this book, well, I, I, I almost hate to say it, uh, a little over 13 years ago. Uh, it was a big leap to go from ministers to madams, from the 19th century uh, to the 20th century. And I wanted to get it right. You know, there's a lot of myths, a lot of lies, a lot of, uh, a lot of hearsay in the gangster world. Uh, and so it was very important to me to, to do the research. So finally, finally, here I am. And I swear to heaven, I am never writing another book after this one. <laughs> I know, I, I feel your pain. I understand <laughs> I've, I've done one myself, but it's, uh, I don't know. I started into another one. Uh, a little more of a personal memoir and I just I, I don't know if I can do it or not <laughs> it is so hard people say oh you need to write a book your life has been so interesting uh, so I, I finally I tried it and it's like oh god <laughs> this is too hard <laughs> I, exactly well anyhow you know and, and what you talked about is something that I often say when I'm talking about these old gangsters the original mafia guys is they came to america in the turn of the century they were bright young men they didn't speak the language or at least like a native they learned it pretty quick but they didn't have much opportunity because they were foreign they were different they had an accent they were darker they they didn't have your know, your contacts of the last two or three generations that built up businesses and governmental contacts and the, the Irish had, uh, and had come over a little earlier and they had all the government jobs by the time right. the uh, Irish and the police and the Eastern European people got here. And, and they were not gonna allow anybody in uh, to their, their government jobs if, unless they had to. And, and so you got bright young people uh, who normally would be successful in whatever they did and every opportunities not open for them. So they turned to crime. There's opportunity in crime. I think you're you're absolutely right. And it's something you can tell that uh, it's kind of that generation that's been stranded. Often their kids are fine. They're born in the United States. Yeah. They go on and it's about the same for them. And then their parents are basically old country people. And it's really that in-between generation. I think you're you're just right there. So Polly Adler was really the, the female equivalent of Mayor Lansky, for example, who, you know, didn't speak the language and is Eastern European origins, grew up in the same basic neighborhood. And, and uh, you know, then he had a uh, head for numbers and, and had, a, had a lot of guts and 
or ball, as we say in the in the business, he had a lot of balls, and uh, yes, and she, for a woman, she had uh, she had a lot of balls. Oh, yes. she can move into this very competitive and and probably could be vicious yeah. trade in in the sex business, the sex worker business. So uh, uh, let's start talking about Podley Adler a little bit. Uh, what kind of how did she first get started? I mean, you know, we always in in modern times. Debbie, we think of prostitution because it's, it's so different now than it once was. It was much more, um, I don't want to use the word sophisticated, but society was not so disapproving of sex workers in the turn of the century. Uh, and as now, the only thing we think of now was street prostitutes and crack whores and things like that, and a lot of derogatory language about it that you know wasn't quite the same back then. And so how did she get started into this? Well, you're at, you're absolutely right. Uh, she, uh, let, let's say she drifts into the business uh, it, in a way that a lot of the social workers and a lot of the moralists and the Sunday school uh, lectures uh, would say was a classic way, quite frankly. Uh, she's working as a seamstress in a, in a factory, in a garment factory in Brooklyn, living with some cousins. Uh, and she is pretty much unsupervised, uh, got no parents to tell her what to do or to keep her at home. And so she starts going out to the dance halls. Uh, she starts spending time parading up and down the streets with her pals, sitting on uh, street corners, you know, sitting on the stoops, flirting with boys, uh, smoking cigarettes. Start, uh, she doesn't drink at that point. Uh, but you know, it, it is a tougher world, you know, and it, there's nothing like uh, a teenager who's just feels trapped. She feels trapped in a, in a low wage job. All she wants is an education. She had really wanted to go to college. She hadn't even been able to finish high school. She stopped at 14. As soon as the law allowed her to stop working, uh, she was forced to go to work. Um, and like a lot of people, she wasn't dead poor. A lot of women who drift into these uh, things. She wasn't dead poor. She was poor, but it was more a mental feeling of being forever trapped, being forever in this, this world that offered her nothing, that was always going to step on her, that was drab, that she could barely afford to live. And what was she going to do? Marry somebody just as poor as her and have a ton of kids? And, and it just, she just couldn't see a future. And I don't she think there's a chance in the world that she ever intended this. But just little by little, she found herself hanging out with tougher girls and tougher boys. And she, and, you know, usually, Really the way people enter prostitution, and this is the way certainly true now as it was then, is not usually that someone has trafficked you or kidnapped you or done something against your will. It's often that you look around and you think, I need something better. And oh, look, there's a friend, another another girl, or maybe a guy who's being nice to you, uh, that, you know, giving you a little something to eat or taking a little bit of care of you or a friend who's always got a nice dress and always living a better life. And they start little by little telling you about this life. Well, this is how I got my money. These are where the opportunities are. You're a chump for thinking you should just stay at the factory. You're a sucker for doing it the way everyone tells you to do it because look, clearly the American dream doesn't include you. And so you don't necessarily mean to go that path, uh, but little by little you'll say, well, you know, why not uh, take a little money uh, for some stockings or for help out with my rent? And you start little, you know, you, and, and but the real decisive thing for her was, um, well, uh, just to be frank, she had a boyfriend who she thought her, was her boss, who she thought was really a marriage prospect. She thought they were going to get married. They're quite serious. And uh, he raped her uh, out in Coney Island in an in, in empty house. And it was a, a, what we would now call date rape. And uh, it was very traumatizing for her. I think it, it created bitterness uh, in her. Uh, it left her feeling even more alone. Uh, and then, uh, like a lot of people, she sunk into a little, who experienced that, sunk into a depression, uh, kind of started acting out. Her cousin kicks her out of the house. Well, now what's she going to do? And as many people in the uh, sex trade say, uh, she already had been labeled as a bad girl. And the phrase often is, uh, if you've got the name, you might as well play the game. 
Uh, and frankly, uh, the money is just fantastic. The money is three times, four times, 10 times what she could make uh, just working as a legitimate person. And, you know, at a certain point, you start to feel like a chump if you're turning down that money to be respectable for who? Who's going to pay attention to your respectability? Uh, and so that that's how she began, uh, picking up guys at the, at the uh, you know, in the bars. Uh, hey, she's very shady about talking about this. Nobody ever likes to talk about how they get into the sex trades uh, because there's usually some part of you that's choosing it, you know, that knows you're choosing it. Uh, and then there's always some part that feels like you're up against the wall and you don't have a choice. And I think that's always very uh, difficult for people to talk about. Uh, so that's how she began, uh, but she, she took off fast. So now, uh, and back then, this was kind of, this was more common in the cities all the way up till probably the 70s, the best I can remember was houses of prostitution where there actually would be a house in a neighborhood or an apartment right. building that would have several apartments, a small apartment building in which the madam would live there and the kind of a wo older woman who would run the place and they would have a lot of younger women living there. And we don't really have that equivalent today, at least in most cities that, that I ever ran into uh, since uh, I think when I first came on the police department in 1970, I remember there was one kind of a still that everybody knew about and probably a lot of guys had gone to he, cops had probably gone there too. Uh, and they kind of had this deal <laughs> back in the old, by the sixties and the seventies, they started, that thing started drifting away, but uh, a little trade out and, and leave yeah. them alone. And, and, but you'd have to take care of certain, especially the vice officers. Yes, absolutely. Well, and you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. The, the, the history you're describing is dead on. Uh, she herself, Polly herself, will tell you, in, as she does in her memoir, that she would never been likely as successful, so successful, except she comes on the scene at a kind of crucial moment in shift in vice and crime. Uh, that's, you know, it's prohibition. So she's, she's 17, she's raped around the time that she's about 17 years old. Uh, it's the, we're in the middle of World War I. Uh, as soon as uh, we get to the armistice of World War I, all of a sudden, uh, we're just about to enter prohibition. So they've tried, prohibition wasn't just uh, getting rid of the saloons. It was also part of a whole effort to get rid of prostitution, uh, to get rid of drugs, the drug trade, uh, just trying to really make this place a paradise on earth for the godly. <laughs> uh, and so those old neighborhoods, the Tenderloin neighborhoods or the red light districts, uh, get busted up. They are required to close down uh, if they want to have any any federal troops around there. Um, so, so all those old brownstones, all those old brothels you were just describing start closing down. Same time, you get the rise of speakeasies, which are a, a place that they can operate kind of in a way, uh, sometimes the word now would be a bar girl or a b-girl. Uh, so that gives a secret place to pick up men. And you also see uh, the telephone coming into wide use. So together, you have uh, a switch from these old red light districts to uh, call houses, as they often call them, where you might have a girl or two living in. Polly often would have a girl or two in her apartment. At her height, there was a time that she was so protected by the vice cops that she had four or five girls living in. But that was that was in the freewheeling days of the Roaring Twenties when practically uh, everything went. Uh, the New York was almost a wide open town. Uh, but as soon as they start really clamping down, she basically runs a call house business. And what a call house business is essentially is uh, she's got her, just like what it sounds, she's got a, a list of about 100, 200 women, maybe more at, at her peak. Uh, who are willing to go on dates for her. And she's got a client list uh, of people who she trusts uh, or people who've been introduced to her by people she trusts who call up and they say, can I come by and maybe, uh, you know, have a drink and sit in your place and go off to the bedroom? Or can you send me uh, a girl to my hotel or wherever you want to meet? Or, and plenty of them, they, and this still happens today, plenty of men want 
wanted to just take them out on dates because uh, you know i hate to say it we're gonna just be crude here but they're a sure thing you know it's a why why take a straight girl on a date and uh, spend all that money in the nightclub and uh and then have it not not go the way you want it at the end and i think that that you know so a lot of women who worked for her you would never know and i think that's that's still true that there are a lot of women who would do it part-time uh, do it occasionally and then stop and never do it again so you know, she gets going, she starts, uh, she becomes known. She has to have this client list and people have to know who she is and how to get hold of her. And, and at this point in time, the uh, the old mustache Pete's and the mob are, are being pushed out by these younger guys, by the Lucky Lucianos and Frank Costellos and Mayor Lansky's. And they're much more organized and, and especially people like Lucky Luciano, he, he he wanted to control everything. He wanted to control all the vice activity. And Frank Costello really was his gambling arm, I'd say. He wanted mm -hmm. to control gambling and know all about the gambling. Mayor Lansky was in gambling too. But Luciano really wanted to control everything. And he wanted to control New York. So you've got these women making a lot of money and, and they're going to want to move in on them. And so I noticed as I was going through your book, there were several references to Lucky Luciano. And we all know that Tom Dewey put him away for taking money from prostitutes. They, they claim it was a trumped up charge. So uh, can you, do you deal, do you address that at all? The, the absolutely. Absolutely. I sure do. Uh, there are, there are a number of things that I think will be controversial in the book. One of them is Polly's claim that uh, she provided women to FDR uh, at Franklin Delano Roosevelt and that she was being paid for her silence uh, and that that was part of her success. Uh, but I think as controversial, certainly among your audience of gangland readers, is the question of whether or not uh, Lucky Luciano really was involved in prostitution. And I know that I would say the conventional wisdom is it was then and it is now. How could he? I wouldn't take money from, uh, from prostitutes. I don't take money from women. I have to say, because I spent a lot of time on this because I knew that well, it was important, and I also know how much people care about this. I have to say, I, I've come to a different conclusion. I do not think uh, Lucky was ever a pimp. He was not. Uh, uh, that was never his thing. But uh, let me also start by first saying Lucky and Polly were very good friends. Polly knew all of those guys uh, from the time that she just started getting into the business when Arnold Rothstein takes her up as one of his, uh, he's a patron of her and he introduces her to the gamblers and the up and coming bootleggers. And she shares, as we were saying, the same kind of background and not just the same kind of background, but the same kind of attitude, very different than the mustache Pete's. She's a modern businesswoman and that's, and she likes everyone or she likes all kinds. I won't say she likes everyone. So they had a lot in common. They were, she was already, Lucky's uh, madam that he used that anytime he had a party, anytime he had guests coming from out of town. Uh, she really liked Meyer Lansky enough that uh, in her notes, uh, when she's writing her book, she says, I will not use his name in my memoir because I like him too much. And in fact, uh, I had the notes that she and her ghostwriter used the list of names of uh, the people who could not be mentioned in the book lists every single major gangster of the 1930s, uh, uh, which I thought, <laughs> well, just as well for her safety. Um, so when it comes down to, we're talking about 1935, 1936, when Dewey is trying to find a way to get to Luciano. He's now become the, the man in New York. He is now the dominant crime figure. He's the head of the, the National Crime Syndicate. Uh, and I, they are just finding, Dewey's having a terrible time trying to find any way to bring him down. But one of uh, his uh, assistants, uh, uh, a, a woman named uh, Mrs. Carter, all of a sudden, Esther, her, her first name is uh, escaping me, and I'm very sorry about that because she was a very important woman. Eunice, I think was her name. Uh, she notices, huh, there are all these kind of payments going up. There are all these people mentioning his name in, in the relationship to these prostitution cases that I'm running across. Polly herself in her memoir describes the Mott Street gang um, who are a 
old old associates from Little Italy uh, who have been working with Lucky for years. Uh, Tommy the Bull, uh, a bunch of a bunch of people who, you, if you know Lucky, you will recognize their names. They're the ones who decide we're going to move in on the prostitution business. That there's money to be made here. There are already um, there's already a kind of business of uh, a guy named Nick Montana who has made a business of as a booking agent. He basically works like a talent agent. He provides girls to the brothels. They uh, the madams pay back money for some protection from the cops and they. Pay pay money uh, for uh, bail bonds uh, so that in case they get arrested, he'll come bail them out and he has the money. It's actually a pretty good arrangement. It's like a regular business and, and everyone gets along great. Everyone's making money. Well, the problem is once the booze market goes away at the end of prohibition, everyone who's in organized crime needs to find new sources of money. So this is one of them, right? That uh, This is a one, one, an untapped an untapped well of money, because there are hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of brothels, thousands, tens of thousands of women working in the sex trades from the street walker to the very high end call girl. So they see this as, you know, a, a windfall. So they start moving in on Nick Montana and his associates. They start beating up the madams, telling them, you got to pay us now. They come to Polly, even though Polly has very high up friends. I don't think they realize how high up they are. she is. Uh, she's very, mu very much considered like the president of the ladies auxiliary of the national syndicate, if you will, <laughs> and uh, has known most of them since they were young, young hoodlums. And uh, she gets her friend Dutch Schultz uh, and Charlie Lucky, Lucky Luciano, to clamp down. Well, they never come back to see her. However, they keep moving in on the other madams. Eventually, Dewey has a very famous raid. He arrests uh, more than 50 women all in the same night. That Polly, because she's got such good, uh, good contacts in the police department, gets a heads up. Heads, she's on her way to California pretty much by the time uh, everyone else is getting arrested. But then Dewey keeps all these women there. Now, here's where the conflict is. Is, is, Dewey, is Dewey somehow manipulating these women to set up Lucky? Well, the idea that Lucky did not take money from the Mott Street gang, Tommy the Bull, his guys, uh, is what all of the controversy hinges on. Uh, and the, the way that it is said is, there are two, way, two things that are said. One is, hey, I never heard, nobody ever heard that he was, uh, had, a, had his nose in this pie. Um, well, Polly herself insists that uh, Lucky was no pimp. She's part of the, she's on the other side of this debate. She insists, ah, he, no, 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 he didn't, he didn't take money from prostitutes. You can't believe her any more than you can believe any criminal, I'm sorry to say, when it comes to their actual bread and butter and their their own hide. Um, because she, in the rest of her notes, it, she's made it very clear that she turns to Lucky to get him to get those guys off her back. Well, why Lucky? Well, she also makes it very clear that she knows a lot of these people. And yes, it's true that they probably were not given money to Lucky. But on the other hand, maybe, maybe it's possible. You know, she kind of hints around like, oh, all kinds of little holes in the story in her complete denial. But then the other reason why people say it's impossible uh, that Lucky could possibly have been taking money from prostitutes is simply that oh, I don't take money from women. Well, that part is ridiculous. That That is just, a, there's a bunch of reasons why it's ridiculous. Let's just say this. Uh, many of his colleagues, including Al Capone, Johnny Torrio, uh, Joe Adonis, uh, Waxy Gordon, all not only had begun their careers by uh, running prostitutes or running brothels or shaking down pimps or shaking down brothels, but most of them actually had uh, pieces of brothels. Most of them still did by 1936. They were making money. So the idea, and it was very common, in fact, even you would never say it, but if you went to jail as a man, if you wouldn't, were being sent up to Sing Sing, it was extremely common for you to say to your girlfriend, uh, listen, I expect you to go out on the turf, as, as they, uh, to use the phrase, uh, to make money so that I can have an easier life in prison. The only rule is, Never go out with any, never take a date with any of my colleagues, uh, gang, any gangsters, and never let anyone know. 
So it was ex actually extremely common if taken. In fact, as Lucky himself says, uh, why would I be taking money from the prostitutes when I'm already taking money from the pimps? Well, <laughs> taking money from the pimps is taking money from the prostitutes. You're just a little. And then there is, in fact, other uh, there's other information like, well, as you yourself said when your introduction here to this topic, uh, like any mob boss, he'll give you protection for your racket, but you got to kick up some cash. Yep. So the way I would say it is, no, I don't think luck. This was not Lucky's thing that he was like, hey, let's. In fact, there's some evidence that he was kind of shying away from it at the end because it was very it's a high profile mess. Yeah. It's, a, it, you know, uh, uh, but he didn't take it very seriously and he didn't want to turn down the money. Uh, and I think that's about how I would say it is. No, I don't think he was, there's no reason to think he was taking a lead pipe and hitting madams over the head as the, as his minions were. But in fact, no, he was taken, he was taken up a little cash, a, a kickback, the way anyone in a racket would kick up to him. And that, that part I think is uncontroversial. In fact, it would be highly unusual for uh, a gangster to say, well, I'm sorry, but my gentlemanly scruples will not allow me to take cash from that racket. I, I even the uh, the well-known old saw about how we don't we don't take money from drugs. Yeah, I'm sure there are those who really don't want to be in the drug business, but that doesn't mean if you're protecting a your neighborhood guy who's got a drug business, you won't take a little cash. Yeah. So that's, I guess, how I would say it. Yeah, interesting. You know, it's. Uh, um that's the way it is. They, they claim they don't touch this dirty money and whether it's narcotics or, or prostitution, but since they didn't have the uh, uh, RICO law back then, racketeer influence and corrupt organization, and that's how they get these mob bosses today. They can claim that they're not getting money from this, but then pretty soon they got a storyteller that you know explains the organization and how it works. And so you've got these other guys that you can directly tie to the, the, the dirty money, shall we say, the, the money from the houses of prostitution, the brothels, and the Mott Street group, and then Lucky is getting money from them. So yeah, know, that's Rico, that's how it works. And, and in fact, like most, most of the top gangsters, he had become really good about insulating himself. Right. I mean, that, that was the whole point. Uh, but that doesn't mean you uh, go broke. You, know? <laughs> you, know, you mentioned uh, a Dutch Schultz. I've done a little bit on him. Uh, he was quite a character. He, he was, I could see him wanting to use prostitutes all the time. He, uh, they probably didn't like him coming around. Everything I've read and I've learned about him, he was, he was coarse and, and maybe even physically dirty and, and dangerous and, and crazy. What, what did you learn about Dutch Schultz? Oh, well, Dutch, uh, Dutch is a main character in the book, actually. I mean, all the other guys, they come in and out. She clearly knew them all and uh, some better than others. Uh, knew Frank Costello well, but she's very, she's very uh, delicate with him. But Dutch is dead by the time she writes her memoirs. <laughs> uh, well, long, long dead. And uh, he well, was not a, a very lovable character, I don't think. Maybe she well, liked him. Those other guys are pretty likable. Uh, well, you know, as somebody recently asked me, I heard that Dutch was a real sociopath compared to the others. I was like, it's a very hard trick to compare the various sociopaths <laughs> yeah, to say true. which one's that's worse. True. But it is true that he, he was more of a loner. Uh, he definitely, I'm sure they all had bad tempers, but he uh, he was known uh, for both his excellent business skills. He was a real good accountant. He was really ran a close tight, well-run business, but he also was known for having a crazy temper uh, more than the others who, yeah. who uh, and in fact, there is a, I suspect that one of the, the, I, the stories that contributes to his unusually poor reputation is that when he was trying to take over the uh, booze business in the Bronx, in the borough of the Bronx in New York City, um, when he somebody one rival who wasn't buying his beer and wasn't letting him move in that he and his partner kidnapped him 
uh, and uh, got a, some gauze uh, that yeah. had venereal disease excretions uh, from gonorrhea uh, and and taped, a, covered the gauze with that excretion and then taped it to the guy's eyes so that he went blind. And of course, hard to know if that's true, but it certainly is a story that to this day still circulates around because it's just a horrifying example of, of what he was like. Um, but funny enough, uh, he really liked Polly. And I can't, I don't know if I could say that Polly exactly liked him, but they were very close. And uh, and although she never, she always called Lucky a gentleman, she never called Dutch a gentleman. Um, at a certain point, uh, Dutch has begun moving down into Manhattan. He's already taken over most of he's taken over the Bronx. He's started to move into Harlem. He's made a very strong alliance with the politician who runs uh, Harlem, uh, Jimmy Hines, who is uh, sort of the protector of the underworld uh, in in these years through uh, 1938 when he's finally arrested and sent to jail um, by Dewey, of course, uh, the great gangbuster. Um, so Dutch has gotten increasingly powerful, but in the same time, he started clashing with the Irish mobs in particular and with uh, with Legs Diamond, uh, who is pretty pissed off that the Jews and the Italians are taking over after Roth, Arnold Rothstein's death. Uh, and with one of his em former employees and uh, gunmen, uh, Vincent Cole, both, both of them uh, Irish. He starts feuding with them and he already knows Polly. Polly is, is the main gangster hangout uh, in Midtown. She's right in the middle of all the gangster owned nightclubs uh, in the upper 50s. Uh, so you'd often like, you know, go out to a speakeasy, go out to the club, stop at Polly's for a nightcap and a screw and, <laughs> and drinks. She made a lot of money off a of drink. Her bar bill often uh, dwarfed her, uh, her uh, bedroom bill and she would host uh, gambling and that sort of thing. It was, it was a safe house for, to hang uh, where you knew there would be no prying eyes, although you might run into plenty of cops. But, you know, that's OK. You're all there for the same thing. Uh, it was a good place to meet cops. In fact, it was a great place to confer with politicians so that her parliament was a lot of the time where they would meet politics, the gangsters would meet up with the politicians. Uh, at a certain point, he's really feuding with Legs and Vince Cole, and he decides he needs a safe house. And so she opens a sort of full service safe house for him, an apartment up on the west side, possibly more than one. Uh, and he basically, he's in and out of there, half living there much of the time. And he's got the gang with him, his uh, Bo Weinberg, uh, Marty Crompier, all the all his his really tough crew, very close knit, tough crew. Um, and that's good for her. She's been in the news lately. She's suffering some financial stress. Uh, this is great for her finances. It helps get her back on her feet after a, after a, 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 some setbacks. Uh, but of course, it puts her right in the middle of these gang wars. And as I'm sure you know, there is some etiquette that you're not supposed to kill yeah. each other in uh, in these social uh, dens. But she's pretty sure that that etiquette could be tossed aside in the wrong situation. And she feels like it's quite um, lucky in the end. Lucky uh, in the end is that uh, he. He, he he's getting he's getting enough pressure that he's got to move out of Manhattan for a little while. And he moves up to Yonkers, which is not very far from Manhattan, but a little safer. He's a little more protected up there. She kind of closes up all the, the safe house. But then he when he reappears, he's gotten kind of spiffed up. He's gotten a little more protected and uh, he comes and celebrates at her house the night uh, that uh, Le Legs Diamond is killed. And it is rumored and probably true that it is by his second hand man or his right hand man, uh, Bo Weinberg. Uh, and they all come to celebrate at her house. Uh, and he also is there when Vince Cole is killed. Uh, so for her, the end of the Irish was great because yeah. then now he's just like a normal, unorthodox businessman coming in and out of the house until right near the end, right near the end, 1934, 1935. He's really now being uh, pressured, Dutch is really being pressured by uh, the FBI, 
by the Treasury Department, uh, trying to get him on tax evasion uh, charges, and of course by such local police as are, you know, are as are trying to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's little by little getting wrapped up into the pressure on Dutch, uh, because anyone who knows anything about the underworld will follow him to her doorstep. It doesn't take hard, it doesn't take much yeah. to connect the two of them. Uh, and so she ends up being arrested uh, around the time that they're really trying to bore down on Dutch in uh, early 1935. Um, she ends up going to jail for the very first time uh, for 30, a 30 day stint, uh, a stretch in jail, with five days off, five days off for good behavior. Uh, she actually writes quite a lot about her 30 days in the women's prison in Manhattan. And it's interesting because uh, it's probably her most honest uh, you know, section because what what she got to hide now she's already known she's in jail and I think it was much as it was humiliating because she wanted to be somebody she wanted to be a somebody capital S somebody uh, she wanted to be respectable she wanted to have enough money to at least buy respectability it was humiliating and t crushing but it was also restful I think it was the first time she got a decent night's sleep in about 15 years because she by that point she'd been in the business for 15 years she gets a, she only gets such a small sentence though because of lucky it's lucky who arranges uh for, with the da to strike a deal so that she uh it's only 30 days she gets out once again she's pretty broke uh she's under a lot of suspicion uh but dutch is already uh on the run he's out in new jersey trying to stay away from dewey uh and by october she gets out in june end of june and Dutch is, as we all know, was killed with his crew, all of whom she knew very well uh, in October of that month. Uh, so uh, that was that was the end of Dutch. And then it's all Italians, basically, from that point on in her world. Wow. Well, yeah. well, I'll tell you what, Debbie, this is this is a really interesting book. And I, uh, and I applaud your Herculean effort to uh, <laughs> put this together and, and well footnoted and, and all that, you know, we all a lot of footnotes. <laughs> we never let the facts get in the way of a good story, but I don't think that, I think you found the facts to support a lot of good stories in here with the judging from your footnotes. And there are a lot of great stories in here, just like those. Well, you know, uh, facts, facts and stories. I'll say this. I did try because we know there is probably no part of American culture that is more myths no. uh, around this, uh, the, around gangsters than anything else, except maybe like the Civil War. I don't know. You know, there the people love the they love to think about that kind of power and that mm -hmm. kind of raw you know, that kind of raw contact. And that's the dream. That's the American dream, but from the underbelly side. Um, so I did try very, very hard to track down uh, the rumors, track down the myths, to go back at least to the original sources that I could find a lot of newspaper sources, because of course, the newspaper guys, they love the gangsters yeah. during this yeah. period, they adore them. Because as one of them says, besides being good copy and selling papers, uh, you can't, they can never sue you for libel. Right. So they, you can say almost anything you want. So you can't really even trust the newspapers because of course they're, they're going on rumors and, you know, and, and nobody uh, loves to brag and lie more than a gangster himself. So you, yeah. you just, you know, you can't, you can't always tell. And then let's, let's just face it. Uh, and same thing with prostitution, a lot of lies, a lot of, uh, so I'll say two things. Uh, I, I the one thing that does bother me is when people act like uh, criminals and prostitutes lie more than, for example, than the Johns and customers who go visit. Yeah. The that, that somehow if I have testimony from a banker uh, and I have testimony from a prostitute, we have to give the banker the benefit of the yeah. doubt and presume she's lying. Well, no, they have just as much reason to lie as anyone else, really? for God's <laughs> sakes, maybe more. Uh, they're the one with more to lose. Um, so that really does, I, I tried very hard to take all stories, no matter where they were coming from at face value and then go deep once I, you know, once, to, so I tried to put context, who's telling the story, uh, why might they be telling the story, what else is going on around 
them at the time? What facts can I use to kind of uh, anchor them? But I also did. I also just assume that there is no way to know exactly uh, what happened in a lot of cases. So usually the way I did it uh, throughout the book, as you'll see, is I try to report what people are saying and put them in conversation with each other. So that if you got Dutch Schultz over here saying that Leg Legs is a madman uh, and you got Legs over here saying, you know what, uh, he stole from me. Mm -hmm. I don't have to decide who stole from each other. I let the reader, I lay it out for the reader and yeah. let the reader sort of decide. Uh, and you know what, frankly, I did the same thing when I was writing about the Puritan congregational ministers uh, because people are unreliable, memory is unreliable. Yeah. I think we all, we're all sophisticated enough no nowadays to know that even if you and I are uh, seeing the exact same thing, it's not going to come out of our mouths the same way. <laughs> That's true. I always remember it where I look better. <laughs> 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 I think that's a pretty common thing. Memory always, when I, my memory is telling the story, then I always come out looking pretty good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Even when oh. I don't, I don't, I don't look as bad. <laughs> exactly. And in fact, when when Polly is so, it, she she finally retires uh, around nineteen forty five. Uh, by that point, uh, another to go back to the Lucky Luciano controversy, by that point, prostitution and pornography in throughout much of the big cities, and especially in New York City, is basically uh, uh, an Italian gangster racket. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't run everything, but wherever they can, that's where they're they're certainly deep into that uh, money. Same thing with uh, gay bars, gay pornography, whatever was dirty and illegal, they would yeah. take a piece of. Um, and she wasn't making as much money. You know, pe pro attitudes towards prostitution were changing. Uh, and it was many more straight women were willing to have sex before marriage. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Just put it, be frank, you didn't need prostitutes the same way. Uh, and uh, the economy was changing and she was older. You know, she was at least 45 in 1945. And, you know, it's, it's a young person's game in some ways, you know, all of that stuff. So she retires out to California. Uh, but she's by that point quite famous, actually. She's been in the papers, the gossip column. She's Walter Winchell is one of her oldest customers and a good friend of hers. And he's always mentioned her in his columns. Uh, it can't trust the gossip columns any more than you can trust the gangsters. <laughs> oh, they <they're laughs> really? all tell their stories. Uh, but she has been talking about writing a memoir. She knows tons of people in the literary world. She was very popular among people like the Algonquin Round Table and a lot of the mm. uh, stars of Broadway who become the stars of Hollywood. Would. Uh, and so she keeps talking about writing a memoir. Now, there's always the question of blackmail. Is she threatening to write a memoir uh, because that's a way to keep keep, inter keep interest and attention? Or is it a way to get some money? Uh, she claims that she never blackmailed anyone. And, you know, I don't know exactly fully how true that is. But I will say this, in general, she thought of herself as a businesswoman. And blackmail is not a good business. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a danger. It's far more dangerous than just running a well run uh, brothel. Uh, and it doesn't last. And she was there for the long haul. And she again, as I say, she wanted to be known as a businesswoman. She did not want to be known as a criminal. So it's possible she was talking about the memoir because she was putting pressure on people, but far more likely is she really wanted her place in history to be remembered. Mm. She wanted, you know, everyone remembers Al Capone. Yeah. Why shouldn't they remember her? Or all of her clients who were two bit people who were, but became like the head of RCA. Mm. You know, she, Jock Whitney was one of her clients. Winthrop Rockefeller was one of her clients. Uh, uh, and it always, I think, bothered her that she couldn't be remembered for the companionship she did keep, the companions she did keep. So she writes, she finally uh, writes her memoir in the uh, late 1940s, early 1950s. Well, she's not a writer and it's not easy. You can have an interesting life, but turning it into yeah. a book is not, not easy, as you were just saying. Uh, and she has the problem, of course, of the lying and the having to protect reputations and not being able to tell the whole truth. But also, as you were just saying, making herself the hero uh, that she comes out looking better. So she shops this manuscript around to every publisher in New York City. And there were many more publishers back then, every magazine. And uh, and everyone thinks this is dynamite both in, in both ways. Mm -hmm. This is going to make somebody a lot of money, but we can't touch it. 
and somebody's going to have to fix this book because it sounds like a sob story. You'd think she was a Sunday school girl who just kept finding herself in misadventures where she didn't mean to be somehow taking money for these things. Yeah. Uh, and it's really, I mean, it really was a problem because uh, I, I went, her agent, her literary agent, uh, all her papers are up at Columbia University. So I could see as they're writing and talking about this problem, how are you gonna get it so that you can, this is 1950, 51. How are you gonna tell the story of this woman who's in the sex trades, who's not just plying her own body, but uh, you know, procuring for others and, and selling other people's bodies, or at least renting their bodies. Uh, how do you make her a sympathetic character while also getting in all the juicy details? And of course, in the 50s, as we know, it was more conservative, uh, yeah. certainly at least in, um, in public, at least. Uh, and it, it, they had to bring in a ghostwriter who did not uh, who did her best, like all ghostwriters do, to capture the truth, to capture the essence, to get the facts, but to kind of shape them, you know, shape them in a way that the public can hear it. And uh, it did, does a pretty good job, although we still, I think to the end, Polly would have much rather just been a respectable, nice Jewish lady who, you know, owned a dress shop, maybe a very <laughs> successful dress shop. Uh, Married a doctor. <laughs> yeah, she loved being an uh, author, though, because that book, when it finally does get a publisher, when it is, a, first of all, it's a great read, truly a great read. I, I recommend it to anyone who's in any of your audience who are interested in these things. You will definitely enjoy a very easy, fun read. Uh, not everything is true. Uh, some things are composites. Some things are moved yeah. around every once in a while. There's something that's made up like uh, Polly uh, when at the end she uh, says she's going to send some cigarettes. She sends cigarettes to Al Capone out in Alcatraz. It makes a nice line, but I'm not yeah. sure that that actually happened. Uh, but it, sell, it is an immediate sensation. It sells two million copies. Mm, wow. she, she is suddenly a literary lion, and she is treated that way. And uh, In fact, Time Magazine refers to her, the old cat has become a literary lion, died a literary <laughs> lion. Oh, yeah, man. exactly, exactly. Uh, and there was even, and this would have probably been the thing that she enjoyed the most. She did get to live to uh, enjoy being treated like a best-selling author cool. uh, with all the pleasure that would uh, bring. I'd like to sell 2 million copies of each <laughs> that way too. Like a... <laughs> I sure would. Let's uh, knock on wood. Yes. Uh, but uh, um, uh, that uh, I think that the thing she did not live to see uh, was that um, they made a film out of her movie, out of her book, uh, and which she desperately wanted. And she, and uh Funny enough, this woman who had been scorned had uh, Barbara Stanwyck, uh, Joan Crawford, Martha Ray, mm. who's a very close friend, uh, and a number of other major figures all scrambling to try to get this role playing with Polly Adler. She would have loved that. Mm. Uh, it, in the end, uh, it was made, it was released in 1963, uh, and Shelley Winters ended up being uh, playing the role. Uh, Shelley Winters looks nothing like Polly and the movie is terrible you can watch it on uh, youtube now it really is terrible it was completely panned what, what's, uh, it, what's the name of it i i know i've seen this it, it's called a house is not home just like the memoir oh, okay. uh, and there's a song uh, by bert by bert Bacharach, uh that that became a pretty popular song i don't really like the song either uh and uh but the movie was universally panned just huh. uh, even those who loved polly were like you you ruined it you ruined the story, uh, which is too bad because I think uh, having a good movie made out of your life will uh, make sure you're remembered. Uh, and in, and sadly, Polly was mostly forgotten. I certainly knew a lot about this era, and I had never heard of her. And it's funny because you know she like her friends, like Arnold Rothstein, like Meyer, like Lucky, like Joe Adonis and Frank Costello. I mean. Unlike some of those guys, she really wanted to be famous. She wanted to be well known and remembered. And I think I don't want to say it's just sexism, but I do think there's some sexism there. We like our gangsters. Uh, we think gangsters are central to understanding American culture, to our understanding the way we look at ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, we all I think anyone who's 
familiar with the Godfather trilogy knows that that is a central text in American culture. And, and uh, those figures are central figures in the way we think about ourselves as Americans, even if we don't always like that side. <laughs> Whereas nobody likes to admit that women can be evil, women can be criminals, uh, that sex can be a weapon uh, that people use when they feel powerless and be a weapon to gain power. Uh, and I think it's not just sexism. I think that part of the problem is it's a, it's a business of illusion. Uh, prostitution is. And the whole point is to pretend like you're not paying for this, or if you're paying for it, it doesn't matter because the woman's so excited to be with you anyway. Yeah. That she'd do it for nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, and, you know, the idea that, uh, that, that, that. that the world can be your oyster. Yeah. yeah <laughs> so true. And that nobody wants to read about those, the yeah. dreary mechanics behind yeah. all that, all the fun. I think that's part of it. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> all right, Debbie, this has been great. So folks, uh, you guys out there, madam, the name of the book, I'll have the uh, links to the in my show notes and to the other book that Debbie Applegate did. And I really appreciate you coming on the show, Debbie. This has been fun. It's been a oh, fun it one. Couldn't, it's my first time getting to talk about the book because the book's only Perfect. coming out in a couple of weeks. And I got to say, you have welcomed me to the world of podcasting <laughs> in a way that was great fun. And right. I'll be sure to tune in and hear your other, hear your other guests soon. All right. All right. Well, we try to have fun on this show. If we don't do anything else, we try to have fun. <laughs> Well done. And right. you did. Right. Thanks, Thanks, Debbie. All right. Thank you, sir. You're it welcome. was a pleasure and okay. a great and a great to discover your podcast. I've All become right. a fan. Okay. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Music provided by our good friend and super fan from Portland, Oregon, Casey McBride. Thanks, Casey.